assalamu alaikum ladies and gentlemen and now we can uh, formally uh, start our second panel and the topic of this panel is governance housing poverty and employment so it is important to know the dynamics of poverty before we are, we have to suggest the solutions related to housing poverty and innovate and you as you know over 50 million population is facing income poverty and they don't have access to any decent employment and they are mainly belongs to agriculture sector secondly over 75 million people are facing social poverty i mean they don't have access to any education and health facilities and they don't have any decent living standard apart from this over 55 million people are facing environmental poverty so they don't have access to any sanitation facilities or water facilities last but not least our country is also facing some sort of institutional poverty and this session is uh, belongs to all these of poverty as you know the uh, uh, title of this governor housing poverty and employment so we have a very experienced panel to discuss these issues and to suggest innovative solution that helps government of pakistan to redefine its priorities to address these issues the chair of this session is dr rashid amjad dr rashid amjad has a vast experience in development economics he was a, a director policy planning and employment at ilo he was vice chancellor of pid and now working with lsc pakistan the guest of honor of this session is mr muzaffaruddin he is currently heading akhan rural sports program apart from this he has a huge experience in development area especially community development rural engagement and community welfare and we have a four well experienced panelists i'll start with dr mohammad ahmed zubair he is lead economist at islamic development bank and he has a huge experience in regional policy and he has a the second is dr talat anwar he is currently heading pied school of public policy he was consultant with so many international organization including adb deferred eu and world bank then the third panelist is dr nozat aman she at abstone and all apart from this she has a huge experience uh, in policy making related to poverty and other development issues the last panelist is mr abdul wajid rana he also has served top financial institution including imf world bank adb idb sccp and state bank of pakistan now i hand over mic to the chair of the session dr rashid jamil to proceed the session thank you so much let me start by thanking the honorable president of the pakistan society of development economists and the vice chancellor of pai dr asad zaman distinguished panelists very distinguished guests and friends and students when i was young like many people here i always used to find this concept of absorptive capacity rather difficult to understand when you do development economics they say you know if you over invest in some sense then you can get into a question of how do you manage that investment but after listening to about 15 lectures already now you people are going to be subject to four more lectures so i can understand finally the question of absorptive capacity but i am sure that you are young and even if i am old you be of course absorptive capacity is there and we have today a very distinguished number of panelists who will speak to you 
As I say, normally economists fly at either 40,000 feet. Most economists fly at 40,000 square. And they look down and they try to make generalization about what's happening below. And a lot of economists work at 2,000 to 3,000 feet. And they are also very difficult because they cannot see above, but they're too close to the ground. And this is what you get with a lot of regression analysis. I think we are now entering a field and a topic where we are getting much more specific. Earlier this morning, somebody said that this is also the manifesto thrust of the present government, the questions of governance, the questions of housing, the problems of poverty, and the question of employment. I think the title is Pakistan's economy, the way forward. The rail, as the French call the rail problematique, what is the problematique? Restore macroeconomic stability and bring about much needed structural imbalances and reforms and get to move to a sustained high and equitable growth. It is in this context that we must look at the issues of governance, housing, poverty, and employment. Governance, unfortunately, has become a motherhood and apple pie kind of thing. Any problem you can't explain, you say it's all due to bad governance. I'm glad that the thrust of this particular government is to say bad governance is corruption. And I'm glad somebody has said so as it should be said. The second is wasteful expenditure. But the real question is that in the search for governance, for improving norms of your, the rules of the game and implementing them, how will you find the investors? 80% of them don't pay taxes, keep modern, black money hidden away. What is that impact going to be of good governance? Is it going to lead to investment growth? The question of housing, how do you create 5 million jobs, 5 million houses and 10 million jobs in a period when you are going to go through strong demand reduction? How are you going to find the resources from the monetary policy point of view to go into your question of restoring macroeconomic stability? Housing is a very, very important sector because it's very strong forward and back, backward linkages with the rest of the economy. But how are we going to go about ensuring that we can launch the program of the government within the constraints it's had? Then we come to the question of poverty and employment. One of the things we always tell people, the most effective means of reducing poverty is to generate productive and remunerative employment. But can you really explain the almost impossible decline in poverty from 30% as measured by official figures, whichever way you measured it, to almost non-existent poverty in 2017-18? What is it that changed in Pakistan that made this possible? Was it just the Benazir income support program, could that have made that kind of a difference? I certainly don't think so. It made a difference, but it didn't. And if poverty is declining, what is happening to the employment situation? True unemployment has gone down slightly in some years, but there was no improvement in employment. So I think we have a very rich menu of issues, and I'm very happy that we have a very distinguished panel and I won't stand in the way of myself and the panel, and I would request uh, Dr. Sahab Iqbal Sahab to speak first on governance. Bismillah ar rahim Distinguished uh, ladies and gentlemen, assalamu alaikum. Uh, this morning, I think we had very, you know, um, thought-provoking uh, lectures by, uh, by Professor Asad Zaman and then the minister. And uh, some of the ideas that I'm going to present here are really connected to the issues that were raised earlier this morning. Uh, 
I have deliberately kept the title of this uh, presentation provocative, a cross-country comparisons of why some nations succeed and why some nations fail. Uh, you know, in Pakistan, as we have learned, that we have this periodic balance of payment crisis. And as a result of this uh, periodic crisis, uh, you know, the whole focus of the policy elite and the academia um, and, the, and the politician is really geared towards discussion about uh, stabilization measures. But what we have uh, unfortunately missed is the longer term journey of not economic growth, but economic transformation. And there's a difference between the two. Now here I would like to start with a quotation by Imam Abu Hamid al-Ghazali, a great reformer. Um, you can call him in, uh, a, a, a public uh, thinker. And he defined Maqasid al-Sharia as follows. The objective of the Sharia is to promote well-being of the people, which lies, and I think this really touches with the presentation by, the, by Professor Asad Zaman this morning, lies in safeguarding their faith, their self, their intellect, their posterity, and wealth. And the rest of the presentation is really about posterity what you are transferring to the next generation. And economic transformation is a long-term journey. Another background is that since I come from um, MDB, and we have a, you know, a, 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 a development country partnership uh, development strategy, which is usually involves three to five years um, development assistance programming, and also we have in many countries elections and you know, so the whole focus of uh, public policy discussion revolves around three to five years horizon. So I think it is important to keep the perspective or the drivers of what, what, what is driving the long-term economic transformation. Now here, how nations succeed, how to achieve economic transformation. Now, there are three major elements in my view. The structure of national output is periodically transformed in a manner to sustain long-term growth and employment. The second important part is that constitutionalism, political governance, national institutions transform and mature in line with the different stages of development. Institutions, Governance structures which we had in the 1960s are no longer, uh, can no longer be effective in the 21st century. They need to mature and move in tandem with the different stages of development. And the third most important point is that there exists a broad national political consensus and an intergenerational political commitment to overcome resistance to reform agenda. Typically what happens is that, you know, when you have economic growth, some kind of transformation, you know, business structures come up, and then they have a vested interest in the perpetuation of these policies. The job of the economic transformation is to overcome that uh, resistance to the reform agenda and introduce new nodes of growth. Why nations fail? And this, of course, I borrowed from the famous book, The Origins of Power, Prosperity, and Poverty. And in this book, there are few key characters that are defined. Poverty is determined by incentives created by institutions. Politics determines what institution a nation has. Dysfunctional or poorly performing institutions lead to extractive or rent-seeking policies and incentives. Plutocracy or elitism or ruling class, they derive their power from their wealth. And the major outcomes is worsening health and income equality 
crony capitalism, elite capture, and we have island of prosperity in a sea of poverty. Now this is by way of introduction. What I've done next is to identify some set of countries where the nations succeeded in economic transformation and set of countries where the nations did not succeed. In the top row, these are the four countries that did succeed. The countries on the left-hand side are the ones where output transformation did take place. And the countries on the right-hand side, they were developmentally tra trapped, if you want to be polite, or they did not, they did not succeed in uh, output transformation. Now, what, what do we mean by output transformation? Basically, the, the notion that how do you create prosperity or wealth is through the, uh, through the manufacturing sector. And the driver of growth or output transformation is the productivity. So really, the source of wealth creation in any society or economy is the extent to which the manufacturing sector evolves and becomes a major, major share in the, in the national output. And please note that what we have here is the data from 1960 to 2018, or 2017, I think. So this is over a very long period of time that what we see is many countries on the left-hand side, their agriculture share has declined, while the manufacturing sector led by productivity growth, rose. Now the countries on the right hand side, you will observe an opposite behavior, or pattern rather, that although the agriculture sector sort of stayed uh, more or less at, uh, at the same level over a, over a period of three to four decades, but the manufacturing sector has actually declined. Now this is uh, important, how do you finance your economic transformation? And here I would like to highlight a very critical role of the, of the domestic savings. Countries on the left hand side, their domestic savings is always higher than the investment. While the countries on the right hand side, their investment rate is always higher than the savings rate. So basically, the, 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 the bottom line here is that it is, you know, your output transformation or economic transformation is achieved through mobilization of your domestic resources, it is not through foreign borrowings. Another aspect of achieving economic transformation is the declining role of the ODA, Official Development Assistance. You see a common pattern here. You also see a pattern of declining ODAs for the countries on the right hand side. But the difference between the two is the very important role played by the FDI. In the countries on the left hand side, the role of FDI is extremely important from the point of view of uh, uh, transferring knowledge, wealth, uh, management skills, etc. So really what we have here is a story of economic transformation, which is basically based on domestic resource mobilization, not from um, borrowed resources. And the, there is a role of FDI, which leads to you know, uh, output transformation. This slide is actually the subject matter of this uh, presentation. What we have here are three set of indicators. The first one on the left is government effectiveness. The second one is political stability and absence of violence. And the third one is regulatory quality. Now please note that the countries on the top, hand, top, top uh, row are, you know, the, 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 the scale for the, if you have good, if, if you have a, you know, uh, effective government, uh, if effective public institutions, then they should range between zero to 2.5. And if they are poorly performing, then the range is from minus 2.5 to zero. 
Now observe all the countries that achieved economic transformation. They not, and this is over a long period of time, from 1995 to 2015. The, the countries on the top, not only that they maintain robust institutions, but they remain in the positive territory. While countries on the right, on the on the on the bottom uh, panel, their quality or effectiveness or stability were not only volatile, but they remain in the negative territory. So basically, if you see from a high-level picture, this 20,000 feet uh, sort of uh, helicopter view, then this is the pattern that comes out very clearly that you cannot have economic transformation without good quality uh, government institutions, political stability, and regulatory quality. What is the output, final uh, result of all this? On the left-hand side, we have uh, GDP per capita. And please observe that the scale, the vertical scale, is from zero to 50,000. And we have China, Malaysia, Korea, and Singapore, you know, Singapore being at the, around $50,000 per capita. This is in constant 2020, 2010 US dollars. Countries on the right-hand side, the vertical scale is from zero to 11,000. And this is, except for Turkey, which around 11,000, the rest of the countries are below, below, below $10,000. For example, Egypt and Pakistan is, of course, way below, pr probably in the range of two and a half or three thousand dollars. So, you know, if you if you think about long-term economic uh, um, tra economic transformation journey, right, sir. Um, I have only two slides left, and I will not go into details, but basically, I would like to emphasize. The second bullet, financing economic transformation, was based on intergenerational transfer of domestic savings. And I think, you know, since we are always caught up in Pakistan with economic stabilization issues, we need to sort of take the first step for economic transformation by thinking along these lines, that how can we improve our domestic savings as a way of starting economic transformation journey. Believe me, it cannot be based on borrowed money, as we have shown earlier. The second point is economic gov uh, governance factors play a fundamental role in achieving economic transformation. Um, as I was saying earlier, that development states foster national institutions. These have to be nurtured and made mature with built-in capacities to overcome the resistance to reform agenda and to identify emerging nodes of growth so that the national resources can be directed towards achieving that output transformation, uh, periodically uh, you know, changing the, uh, the, 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 the output composition. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. I think you said three things, government effectiveness, political stability, and regulatory quality. Now let's see if the causality is right here. Give some thought to that. And now I ask Professor Dr. Talat Anwar Sahib, you have the floor, sir. Thank you very much. There has been an increasing interest in poverty especially in Pakistan, and uh, it's mainly because of the fact that poverty reduction is a benchmark by which the performance of every government is seen nowadays in uh, almost in every developing country. So, and if you look at the poverty reduction record of China, China has reduced poverty uh, drastically. Uh, the record, their record has been uh, uh, remarkable. They have, Aage Chale, next. So they, uh, China has reduced poverty from 35% in 1978 to about 3% uh, in 2015. So I think recently Prime Minister Imran Khan has requested uh, in his recent visit to China 
uh, to share the Chinese, uh, uh, to share Chinese experience with Pakistan. So I'm going to talk in this context about the Chinese experience of uh, learning from the Chinese experience and what are the poverty reduction program in Pakistan. So first I will talk about the Chinese government targeted intervention for poverty alleviation, the Bao program, then uh, Chinese rural reform, then Chinese national uh, development plan uh, for poverty reduction. Then uh, we have a, a major poverty alleviation program in Pakistan, BISP, Benazir Income Support Program. And I will evaluate uh, critically what we, we should do with the BISP because it is consuming uh, huge resources. And, uh, and then I will ask, uh, I will examine what are the lessons from Chinese experience. Then I, I, have, I have to propose a national microfinance program as an alternative to BISP. The next one, please. Yeah, DBAO. DBAO program is the Chinese government target, has various targeted intervention. The major one is the DBAO program, which is primarily, uh, which is a primary social security program called Minimum Livelihood Guarantee, uh, or the DBAO. DBAO means Minimum Livelihood Guarantee that targeted to poor in the rural and urban areas. And uh, in this, uh, I think, program, they have various initiatives like low rent houses for the poor. Chinese government provide assistance to uh, poor families uh, for the rent, low house rent. And then uh, they have a targeted health uh, reform program that provide medical help in the form of uh, cash subsidies, mainly through reimbursement, including uh, inpatient treatment and insurance premium. In addition, low-cost medical insurance was also provided to low-income uh, people in this program. Then, uh, you know, ch uh, Chinese government have another, uh, 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 two more inter intervention. Educational emergency that provides support for implementing policies by the non-governmental organization. And another is the emergency provisioning that was introduced in 2007 and that provide temporary supports uh, to uh, you know, fam families in an emergency, uh, encountering sudden disasters, precarious diseases, startling incidents, and so on. So you know, they have a health program. So these five, five programs, they have targeted intervention. I think uh, th uh, these uh, programs have been very successful uh, in reducing poverty in China. Next one is the rural, what, they have, what China has done. China has uh, done rural reform, and the first phase was the rural reform, was the household responsibility system, under which equitable land was allocated to millions of individual farmers with remuneration linked to the output. And as a result, you know, you know, at that time, Chinese economy was opening, and due to the opening of Chinese market, the sh and sharp prices increase of agricultural product. Agricultural production grew rapidly, and that led to growth in income uh, of the poor and reduction in rural poverty. And as a result, you can see that the uh, rural, par rural per capita income increase at a rate of 15% per annum. It's a record increase. And uh, between 1978 and 84, and rural population declined from 33% in 1978 to 11% in 1984. And I think uh, they have other program, later on they introduced uh, Chinese National Rural Development Plan for Poverty Reduction in various stages between 1986 and 1993. The first stage was on the basis of uh, equitable intervention. The poor regions have embraced development in terms of culture, education, uh, healthcare, and other social undertakings. In the second stage, the government launched, a, launched a, its poverty elevation plan. A special, a special focus was given to livestock, raising cash crops, pl planting, and labor migration. As a result, rural poverty decreased to 30 million uh, by 2001. Then China flagship program, evolution, poverty elevation program was uh, with community-based uh, decentralization ideology by 2001, 21% of all rural villages were officially designated as poor villages. These villages were targeted by providing education, training, subsidies, loans, so and so. So these programs have also remained successful. Now, you know, what is the you know, secret behind and what makes difference uh, 
China with Pakistan, you, this slide is explained. Uh, the share of government social expenditure and GDP, if you, if you look at in the graph, you will see that the share of uh, uh, government, uh, Chinese government has been spending uh, significant of amount of money uh, in education and health. As a result, education spending increased from 2.4 percent to 2.6 percent in 2002 and then 2.7 percent in 2002. Finally, they, uh, it has been gone up to 3.5 percent. It, uh, now, recently it is much higher now. And uh, on the other hand, uh, they, earlier they had the same level of health spending at the moment uh, as they have, uh, as we have at the moment which was about 1% of GDP, which declined then. Now it rose to about 1.6% 1 1 of GDP. But what is the difference? Uh, what makes the difference uh, China with Pakistan is the cash transfer. Chinese have a huge cash transfer program. So we choose to be around 1% of GDP. It increased uh, to 2.2% of GDP, and, uh, and uh, then finally to 2.3% of GDP in 2011. And if you look at the Pakistan, uh, ex you know, allocation, you will see that Pakistan allocation has been about 2% of GDP, uh, uh, while health uh, allocation on health was 1% of GDP. It has remained stagnant between 1990 and I think 2018, I would say. And, the ca and if you look at the cash transfer, we have only point, we spend only 0.3% of GDP on cash transfer, which is in contrast to China. You know, they spend about 3.5 percent of GDP. As a result, you can see there has been a significant decline in poverty from 35 percent in 1978 to about 3 percent in 2005. We have a number of uh, poverty elevation program in Pakistan, Baitul, run by different organizations, but BISP is the largest one, you know, and BISP has various components. It has cash transfer program, it has uh, co-responsible conditional cash transfer program, then Vasile Sehat uh, health program, insurance program. So under the cash transfer program, about 5.7 million eligible families are paid an amount of rupees 1600 per month without any condition. On the other hand, uh, under the Vasile Tale, which is the conditional cash uh, transfer uh, that was initiated to support primary education of up to three children to two million families. Uh, a rupee uh, 250 per child, 250 per child is given to the poor families under this. Uh, so we have Vasila Sehat, but this Vasila Sehat program is uh, the coverage of the Vasila Sehat program is very low. Uh, you know they provide uh, uh, you know maximum 25 percent rupees per family for treatment uh, as an insurance, and then since the inception, if you they have run various pilot program since the inception. I think uh, they have provided up to uh, you know 500,000 uh, population uh, in 2000 up t uh, until 2015. So the and then they have Vasile Rozgar. The female female beneficiary or her nominee is given vocational training, demand driven trades in selected public and private institution. Then Vasila has since 2009. The scheme is targeted to providing interest-free loan amounting to rupees 300,000 to beneficiary families, rupees 2.2 billion disbursed among 13,000. So still you can see the people, we have poor people, and we have millions of poor people, the, but beneficiaries are in thousand. The coverage is highly inadequate. Now I have some observation on uh, BISP. The cash transfer have weaknesses in terms of creating dependency syndrome and lacking financial sustainability. As uh, you know, PIDE has also done some paper, uh, you know, Dr. Durin Nayab has done research and Dr. G.M. Arif has also done a paper. So dependency syndrome is the main weakness of the, because it cash transfer create dependency, they create, uh, you know, they uh, create, uh, you know, disincentive to work. So people, when people are getting free money, why they, are, they would work? why they will, uh, they, will, they will go for sustainable livelihood. So that is the uh, objection, you know. And then accept the cash transfer coverage of other component is very low, which is hardly, which hardly produce significant effects on poverty reduction in Pakistan. Huh? Okay. So 
So I'm not going to talk about the, po I think poverty, uh, if you look at the concept of poverty, it is linked with the uh, inflation rate. Poverty has been underestimated in Pakistan because of the underestimation of the inflation rate. As a result, the poverty has declined from 34% in 2002, uh, in 2002 to about 8% in 2014 and then uh, for to 5% in 2016. So and, uh, currently I think we don't have any poverty in the country. We don't need any poverty program. If you look at this, it starts six. So as a result, you know, government has uh, uh, revised the benchmark upward. Now the, now the poverty level is again at 24%. Uh, so now I will, uh, uh, you know, l talk about uh, some lessons from the Chinese experience. Cash transfers have weaknesses. So CCT should be preferred over unconditional. I think CCT should be, a con uh, a cash transfer should be eliminated in my view and, uh, and uh, an unconditional cash transfer should be eliminated because they create dependency syndrome while conditional cash, cash transfer should be continued because it has potential for, for poverty reduction. Then uh, China introduced tar targeted employment program. China hired employment people, uh, unemployed from in program like food for works that can be initiated in rural areas in Pakistan and uh, construction of a, of a project can be involved in this kind of context. And then we have a health pro insurance. So it's like China, Pakistan can adopt dynamic health policies as was done in, uh, I think, KP government should introduce. Uh, in the federal and other provinces. And then we have strengthening local government institution. China, Chinese record has been uh, due to the strengthening of the local institution. The local, because the local governments are directly accountable to the people at the grassroots level, unlike provincial government in Pakistan. So I think we should devolve the power, uh, poverty issue at the local level and we should initiate the program and that will have an impact. And then China did multi-targeting instead of only one targeting like Benazir income program. So we should also introduce multi-targeting program. So, uh, you know, secondly, you know, I would say that unlike pa China, pa unlike Pakistan, China did not pursue IMF policy prescription for new liberal reform. Pakistan opened its market swiftly under the IMF conditionalities, whereas China did it itself only for industries that were ready for international competition and protected the domestic industry that was prone to competition. And that is the secret of China uh, in, uh, you know, that um, uh, secret of China in high, uh, 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 you know, economic growth rate. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Uh, Chairman Saab, uh, Dr. Hasid Zaman, students, ladies, and gentlemen. Um, I would like to first thank the uh, PIDE people for inviting me. It's always been a pleasure to be here, and they take such good care of you. Uh, let me start by saying that housing is a huge, huge, huge problem in Pakistan and in most developing countries as well. But I just uh, selected a few aspects and which relate to housing for the poor in Pakistan. Uh, there are other issues as well. And since Doc Saab is very strict, I'll have to moti moti baatein kar lenge. As it is, lunch ke baat ka session baat mushkil hota to keep awake. I've been a student, I've been there, so I understand. Uh, anyway. Uh, Let's skip that. Uh, let's see the magnitude of the problem, as you can see. The population, we've been talking about rising population. So various estimates are there uh, which tell you the how many units or what is the magnitude of the shortage. And according to estimates, 10 million units are needed. Uh, each year, the demand is increasing by 400 to 700 units, and only about, at the best estimate, 350,000 are provided. So formal supply also covers only 50% of the demand. 
and we have problems of low quality housing and the existing stock of housing which is there is also deteriorating so we add to that problem and if you look at that figure in the last two lines it says rupees 10 billion would be required annually for the next 10 years in 2017-18 2.3 billion were only allocated for housing so you can see the magnitude of this problem why housing shortages affect the poor first the prices of most of the formal housing is very high and they cannot afford to pay for it they don't have access to credit facilities which require collateral and formal jobs no loans are available for land purchase of land which is the largest component of housing cost the result has been that people find informal housing slums kachiyabadis are growing and they are characterized by low access to services they don't have titles they don't have permits and so on there is also an inverse relationship between income and the size of the household so the lower income households require more housing larger houses and that itself presents challenges of affordability and quality very briefly uh, provision of housing has not been a political priority so far now we we are in the last few months we have been hearing nothing but the 500 50 million houses that the government is going to be providing so there is a lot of debate but traditionally it has not been a priority for a number of years F 5 million sorry <laughs> uh, yeah even 5 is a bit too much but uh, housing market is also characterized by input site failures uh, there is limited availability of land uh, inadequate basic infrastructure most important lack of finances and high cost of building and materials uh, traditionally we have subsidized housing but these subsidies have been ill targeted that's that's what research is showing evidence is showing uh, we have provided assistance to the construction industry but that only has been for the middle and the middle income groups and not for the poor uh, we have focus on home ownership so rental housing is not uh, developed that much we have outdated zoning laws and building regulations and projects are designed without really looking at these all these regulations and institutional reforms which complicates the problem further i'll just give you yeah main moti moti aapko baatein bata deti hu in 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 the interest of time but land market related constraints are the major problem with housing in the country it is difficult to acquire land which is needed if if you're going to build 5 million houses you'll need a lot of land whether it's government land or other land you'll have to acquire it and the rules and regulations take a lot of time so i don't know um, the pm's program how he proposes to do it because that takes a lot of time uh, trunk infrastructure is not available, the complicated property rights, titling, inappropriate and inefficient land use regulations, ex expensive and restrictive building codes, all of these make the provision of housing very difficult. There, is in, there have been some efforts recently for providing finances and increasing the volume of to the housing sector but more or less they have had very limited effect uh, mortgage markets are limited uh, because mostly due to very cumbersome and expensive judicial proceedings uh, they usually are extended to the middle and business income borrowers and the low income uh, households cannot access cannot borrow through these uh, programs there is no special non-bank finances company and in some of the other countries uh, and uh, the mortgage market is therefore very limited okay um, housing policy in pakistan uh, i cannot read that so i'll read it from here uh, priority this this policy has been since 2001 so we are still 
operating under this policy. The current housing policy is that old, and we are still operating under it. It, it says all the right things. If you look, it gives priority to identify, problems related It gives priority to identification of land for housing. It emphasizes resource mobilization, encourages institutions to give mortgage loans, propose a housing refinance window at the state bank, give incentives to the construction services sector, proposed regularization of the Kachi Abadis, emphasized no eviction, emphasized the role of research and building material and construction technology. All the right things, all the problems. If we were to follow this strictly, we would, be able, we would have been able to resolve all the problems. Zara uh, implementation and hakikat mein dekhe. Uh, ye, these are just some of the examples. There are others. Uh, so you can, you can um, for the interest of just demonstrating, I'm looking at these three examples. Uh, PP's, pro PPP's project of Shaheed Benazir Bhutto housing cell, uh, 15,000 poor families were supposed to be provided with affordable plots and homes in, Karachi, in uh, cities of Sindh, including Karachi, have not been delivered. Uh, the chief minister announced allocation of 350 acres of land, but this was never transferred. Uh, if you come to um, Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif's Apnagar program of 2013, uh, it was to, supposed to build 500,000 affordable units in five years via public-private partnership. This is just on files. Nothing has happened. Uh, so we come. We, why are we so hamitne now meet kyu hote hain isliye ki ye sab hamare sath ho raha hota hai so agar koi kehta hai ki hum 5 million houses bana denge agle 5 saal mein ya kis mein to hum usko ek shak ki nigah se bhi dekhte hain kyunki experience ye raha hai lekin ek baat bata dun ki housing ka jitna bhi it takes a long time it is not it is not a short term project it over time it is going to take a lot of time and I think all these problems that I've highlighted have to be looked into. And in the end of the presentation, uh, I'll tell you how this is applicable to Pakistan. We have a lot of success. First, we went a lot of success with housing provision for low-income countries. Success as well as failures, I should say. So first, there was this public housing. Ke sara government khatsa karti thi, wo apne ghar bana deti thi, aur logon ko subsidized rate pe de deti thi. लेकिन उसमें यह प्रॉब्लम थी कि उसका कॉस्ट बहुत हाई हो गया तो वो कवरेज उसकी कम हो गई उसकी वजह से उनको उसको खत्म करना पड़ा फिर स्लम अपग्रेडेशन प्रोग्राम जो कच्ची आबादी है वहां पर आप जो है वहां पर सर्विसेज प्रोवाइड करें एंड दे हैव बीन वेरी सक्सेसफुल इन ब्राजील दे आर लो कॉस्ट वाइड सिक्योरिटी ऑफ टेन्योर देन वी हैव साइट्स एंड सर्विसेज प्रोग्राम where you, the services in a, in a marked area, you give the services and people come and borrow land and then they start building their houses. These were very successful in some countries, including Pakistan. You have heard the name of the Lord of God in Hyderabad. You have heard the Orangi Pilot Project in Karachi. There are other models too. But we have a great pleasure that they are all in the world, but we can't replicate them on a large scale. Replicate them. और उसके बहुत सारे रीजंस हैं लेकिन जो एक बहुत वाजे रीजन है जो सब लोग बताते हैं वो ये कहते हैं कि दिस प्रोग्राम्स वर नॉट दे वर नॉट अलाउड टू मैच्योर बिफोर दे वर एक्चुअली इवैल्यूएटेड एंड ड्रॉप्ड के नहीं ये काम के नहीं है ऑल ओवर द वर्ल्ड एंड इन पाकिस्तान पर्टिकुलरली देयर इज दिस इंक्रीमेंटल हाउसिंग डेवलपमेंट ये क्या होता है कि जो गरीब होते हैं वो थोड़ा अपना आहिस्ता आहिस्ता करके आपने भी देखा होगा आते जाते कि वो आहिस्ता आहिस्ता करके अपना घर बनाते हैं जब उनके पास पैसा होता है कमरा ऐड कर दिया जब कोई एक छत डाल दी कुछ और कर लिया बरामदा बना लिया ये बना दिया इंक्रीमेंटल सो दिस इंक्रीमेंटल हाउसिंग डिवेलपमेंट इज एन इम्पॉर्टेंट एंड वी हैव टू लर्न फ्रॉम वॉट पीपल डू एंड हाउ वी कैन फाइनेंस दैट this is a long term, typically 10 to 15 years, so unko you give them small loans and then they, at the time, and you have to study when, when do they require a loan. So if you study in detail what is happening, you'll be able to capture that. And this is an important development in most of the countries all over the world, 
ऑल दीज प्रोग्राम्स हैव बीन वेरी सक्सेसफुल अगर हम उठा के देखें मैंने कल गूगल किया तो हज़ारों कंट्रीज़ के हज़ारों प्रोग्राम्स आ गए सो वॉट वी नीड टू डू इज़ वी नीड टू स्टडी दोज प्रोग्राम्स सी वॉट पीपल हैव डन बट एट द सेम टाइम वी हैव टू सी हाउ दे फिट आवर सिचुएशन हमारी लोकल सोशल जो हमारा स्ट्रक्चर है और हमारा फैब्रिक है उसमें कैसे ये चीज़ें फिट होती हैं रेंटल हाउसिंग अभी मैंने मैंशन किया हाउसिंग कोऑपरेटिव भी करते हैं कहीं कहीं यूज़र असिस्टेड ट्रांसफॉर्मेशन ये भी इंक्रीमेंटल डेवलपमेंट का होता है ये होता है कि आपने घर में एक कमरा ऐड कर दिया उसको आपने किसी को किराए पे दे दिया तो लोग कहते हैं कि उसमें आके जब या 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 ओ थैंक यू आई शुड हैव सेट समथिंग एल्स सो यू हैव ऑल दीज प्रोग्राम्स लेट मी लेट मी जस्ट गो टू द लास्ट स्लाइड रेलिवेंस टू द करंट गवर्नमेंट्स हाउसिंग इनिशिएटिव एज आई सेड यू कैन लर्न फ्रॉम ऑल दीज प्रोग्राम्स सो फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल द गवर्नमेंट हैज़ टू इंश्योर दैट देर इज़ अ लॉन्ग टर्म कमिटमेंट पोलिटिकल कमिटमेंट एंड इन्वॉल्वमेंट ऑफ स्टेक होल्डर्स उसके बगैर लो इनकम हाउसिंग जो है वो कभी काम नहीं करेगा यू हैव टू हैव अ लॉन्ग टर्म कमिटमेंट टू दैट सेकेंड यू हैव टू मेक श्योर दैट इट इज़ जोग्राफिकली प्लेस इन होता है क्या है कि वो उन्हें आगे बाहर जाके प्लॉट दे देते हैं वहाँ पर उनकी एम्प्लॉयमेंट नहीं होती या पा, पाकिस्तान में भी हो चुका है वो प्लॉट प्लॉट बेच के आके फिर कच्ची आबादीज में आबाद हो जाते हैं सो यू हैव टू सी दैट यू डोंट अप्रूव दीज पीपल अवे फ्राम एम्प्लॉयमेंट अपॉर्चुनिटीज दैट दी हैव दे हैव उनके नेबर्स होते हैं उनके सारा एक सोशल उनका नेटवर्क होता है उससे अगर आप उनको हटा देंगे तो ये कभी भी काम नहीं करेगा सो इट्स इम्पॉर्टेंट Uh, the government has to quickly acquire and facilitate the acquisition of land for this program and ensure that there are no hidden subsidies targeting the poor the subsidies if you do give subsidies you have to make you have to make sure that they go to the poor people and the people who are targeted not to other wealthier which has been happening in pakistan and ensure that regulation on financing construction planning and infrastructure supply as i said enable incremental development and projects are sustainable over time there is some there are some suggestions that you have to link this affordability of housing to how much money people have so there are suggestions and one suggestion is that you uh, to the local median household expenditure ke sath aap usko mutabik kare taaki log wo paisa de sake forced eviction creates vulnerability ab aap dekh rahe hain karachi mein kya ho raha hai wo to khair aur aage bhi pata nahi kya hone wala hai but it it re reinforces vulnerability so you have to be careful uh, when you evict people either from their houses or from their shops which is a source of their livelihood uh, we have to link these projects to regulatory and institutional reforms ek package hona chahiye jisme poverty पॉवर्टी रिडक्शन भी हो जिसमें हाउसिंग भी हो जिसमें और भी चीज़ें हों अनलेस यू डू दैट इट इज़ नॉट गोइंग टू वर्क एंड वी हैव टू प्रोवाइड टेक्निकल कंस्ट्रक्शन असिस्टेंस सो दी आर सम ऑफ द सजेशंस एंड इट्स अ वास्ट टॉपिक बट आई ट्राई टू डू जस्टिस टू इट थैंक यू वेरी मच a respectable chair uh, distinguished guests and ladies and gentlemen vice chancellor pitch university i have been asked to uh, speak on civil service reforms which has been a kind of <coughs> sorry um very uh, uh, loved or beloved topic for many intellectuals and whenever we talk of improving the governance in the country uh without uh hesitation of a moment we speak of robust institutions that dr zubair mentioned and to build robust institutions we need civil service reforms and whenever we talk of civil service reforms the bureaucracy is at the center stage and as before during the 14th century ibn khaldun in his famous muqaddama said 
when an empire begins to enter into a stage of decline, often the bureaucracy becomes corrupt. The ruler becomes increasingly despotic, arrogant, and less just. This leads to a centralization of power and increased nepotism and corruption. Once formal procedures are regularly ignored, this represents the beginning of the end. And if we look around, we are more or less facing the same situation. I mean, does the civil service reform raise as a slogan, as a kind of political uh, 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 slogan or political uh, objective to achieve the attention of the intellectuals or researchers? Uh, Jamil Jarisat, basic, uh, for the a professor in South Florida University said, what are the objectives of the politicians when they talk of civil service reforms? Political regimes are deliberate in limiting the scope and direction of change. Political leaders often endorse personal training or simplification of procedures. They also sprinkle their public statements with calls for more efficient and effective management. At the same time, these political leaders continue to promote to senior government positions unqualified relatives, cronies, and loyalists, and to protect various corrupt practices in conducting the public business. So that basically indicates you to what extent the politicians have been sincere and serious in introducing the civil reform, service reforms in uh, at various times. If we look at the bureaucracy, we can easily divide that bureaucratic rule or bureaucrat bureaucracy into four phases. The first one is the colonial heritage that we inherited after independence from 1947 to 58. Then came the era of military civil bureaucracy, bureaucratic power sharing from 58 to 1972. The third one is popular control of the representative institutions, 72 to 77, and then in some literature, it is labeled as militarization of civil bureaucracy by inducting uh, captain and majors and lieutenant colonels into civil bureaucracy from 78 to 88 and then started the period of politicization of civil bureaucracy generally under the two back-to-back, -back, or as a matter of fact, four elected governments, and then polarized bureaucracy to the extent that it was started labeling as PMLN, pro-PMLN or pro-PPP or pro-PTI bureaucracy. So these are the five or six phases of bureaucracy history in, in Pakistan. So today the perception of the bureaucracy is like that the steel frame of the bureaucracy is getting rusty over seven decades and the ineffectiveness of the state institutions is undermining Pakistan's economic, social and political development due to various causes and reason. And we have tried to reform these ailments in the country by constituting 40 commissions and committees since 1947. Iqbal Essence's effort was the 40th uh, one in, in, in the country to reform the civil service. However, the major mistake those commissions and committees had been doing is that civil service reform is quite often reduced to a technical exercise. Problems are reduced to boxes and then solutions are found to fit into the boxes. The political and cultural context are lost in these exercises. The 41st task forces that have been constituted after the uh, after taking over a power of the current government, they have formed two task forces to reform the civil service. The exercise is no different than the previous 40 uh, efforts that have been made in the country. 
three fourths of the members like make comments, contributions based on their perceptions, anecdotes, and uh, 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 and 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 uh, off the cuff remarks rather than contributing on any evidence-based in-depth analysis. So I don't think the fate of the current exercise would be any different than the previous one. Why we need reforms? Essentially because of failure of traditional approaches, fiscal problems, management deficiencies, political factors, and changing international environment. And in addition to those uh, 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 factors, there are emerging challenges for the bureaucracy that we are moving around the world from co everything controlled by the state to a hollow state, from centralization to decentralization. After the 18th Amendment, we are no longer hierarchical federation. We have moved from a hierarchical federation to collaborative federation and then from top down to participative governance rather than just the governance. Globalization, SDGs, technological advancement, vibrant, vibrant judiciary and active legislative committees, effervescent media and dynamic social media, and accountability and disclosures. So these are the challenges that are being faced by the civil service or the state. And the civil servants have to develop their capacity and intellect level to deal with all the emerging challenges uh, uh, in, in, in Pakistan. In addition to those challenges and failures, the role of the civil servant has expanded quite a bit. Initially, it was just the civil servant and his immediate boss. Now, the civil servant has to collaborate between the public sector and the private sector, uh, between the politicians and the civil servant, public and the private sector, key societal actors, among them politicians, academic institutions, media, and civil society, civil servants and legislature, civil servant and judiciary, and national government and international community. So the civil servant doesn't have to deal with one single actor. It, he has to deal with and make and create a balance while dealing with so many actors and dealing with the emerging challenges. However, any civil service reform to deal with emerging challenges and, collaborate, and collaborators has to make many decisions before we move on to or making recommendations for any, any civil service reform. It's a complex phenomena and not an, 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 a, a few hours debate to, or to, to make any recommendations. The landscape is much wider. The first three questions that any civil service reform task force has to decide what are the political needs assessment before we move to the rest of the of, of the of the of the uh, p uh, pillars of reform what are the objectives what object we want to achieve what are our goals because of the as a result of these civil service reforms and what should be the size and structure of the government the answer to first these three will then trigger the outcome for the rest, and they will have to adjust to the answers found for the first three pillars of the land, uh, civil service landscape. Then the government or any task force has to decide what are its goals for reform rather than making a kind of a, a recommendation which are rather incremental, or for that matter, making cosmetic changes. So once those goals for reform are decided that we want to move to this direction, comes the next decision. What approach you want to, uh, how you want to approach the civil service reform? Should it be incremental, the level of change, 
or should it be extensive and comprehensive? What about the career service? Should we continue with the permanent and lifelong employment, or should we move to, conti uh, con to, to uh, 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 um, uh, contract-based employment that many countries in the world are pursuing at the moment? What about the culture of civil service? Should we be continue being administered as administrative state, or should the focus be on management business efficiency and markets. I mean, what should be the civil service system? Should it be centralized and decentralized? What should be the paradigm shift? Should we want to move towards a business-oriented or approach to government, or should we want to achieve efficiency or an institutional strength? What is needed for paradigm shift is what should be the role of civil servant? Should it be follower or implementer? Or should he be the source of expertise and institutional memory? How should he be appointed? Should it be a bias towards managerial skills or competitive process insulated? Unless we give or find answers to these questions, it will be difficult to sustain any kind of civil service reforms. And quite often than not, the focus of any civil service reforms becomes, I mean, how to reduce the power of one single group, which is Pakistan Administrative Service, or DMG, uh, how to neutralize. So what should be the proposed structure of the civil service? Should it be merit-based merit open system? Uh, do we need to maintain the APUG service? Do we need to create a separate new federal service down to the local civil service? And what about the agency service system? In many, many countries, they have different models for civil service reforms. And the, the, the rulers or the people there have tried to find the solution or answer to all these questions before moving to any kind of civil service reforms. And what should be the level of accountability and how that accountability be implemented. So the main message is that instead of filling up the technical boxes that is being done, that a group is created to uh, work on the performance evaluation, a group is created on compensation, a group is created on recruitment, just to fill the technical boxes will not deliver the answer. It has to be dealt uh, comprehensively and holistically and f have to find the answers of all those issues first before moving on to the civil service reforms and the debate should be evidence-based in-depth analysis of the issues rather than off-the-cuff remarks and focusing or targeting one group of the civil service. Thank you. spelled out and written down so that people take home the right message at the right time. I now have the pleasure of asking Mr. Musafra Din Saab. He's the CEO of Aga Khan Rural Support Program, the chief guest, and I'm sure he'll also sum up the discussion. Thank you very much. Uh, I will, uh, first of all, uh, thanks to uh, Pite because, of course, this is a very, uh, very important forum for inviting uh, some of us who have no bird view rather than a worm view or a grassroot view or practitioners to this forum. So with apology, I will not uh, uh, summarize it. I think uh, our chair will uh, summarize. Here I am uh, sharing with you a because I'm a practitioner, and our 35 experience of a very famous landmark poverty reduction program. We, I, I came from the Ahan Development Network. Ahan Development Network, uh, working in 36 countries, 
with the 12 different uh, agencies, ranging from education, health, culture, finance, rural development. And uh, Aachen Rural Sport Program was established for reducing poverty in one of Pakistan's most poor part of uh, the country. Uh, it was one of the very poor, remote, and challenging area called Gilgit, Baltistan, and Chitra. So this poverty program was designed very differently, of course, coming from uh, learning from different countries, starting from uh, Germany, Raiffeisen, and one of our famous rural development expert, Akhtar Hamid Khan, who designed the RNG pilot project. This model was simply working, supporting, to harness the potential of people, of poor people. And for that purpose, we used very simple three principles which I think answers the questions which was posed during our eminent scholars. The first was organizing people. When at grassroots level, people organize themselves, you can't do anything at higher level. The most important factor was that these rural people were organized into institutionalized organizations, currently called different names, village organization and women organization. And in this part of Pakistan, 80% of households have organized themselves. Participatory, transparent system and ownership was key of this organization. The second principle was capital. Until people have not their own capital, particularly poor, you can't do anything you know, bringing from supply side. So what we did is we asked people to save, do small savings. And people have, uh, for the last 35 years, did a quite very good savings and microcredit program. And the third and the most important principle was skill. We worked with people to provide them basic agriculture skill, you know, because we took our inputs from Chinese model, and then leadership skills, employable skills. So these were the three very basic intervention we did in this part of Pakistan. And as a result, very interesting happened. Maybe some of you uh, see in media. This area, which was 80% of people of below poverty line, in just two decades, the poverty come down to just 24%. And in some district, the recent government did a mixed survey, is only 2%. This and 99% literacy in some districts. This happened because these people took charge of poverty reduction. And this model was, of course, then replicated in Pakistan, in 10 other countries, particularly India took it. And uh, maybe if you see the current, uh, the largest program of uh, poverty reduction in India or in the world, they have acknowledged it that we learned it from Pakistan, from AKRSP, from Northern Pakistan. So this was a comprehensive work which was uh, replicated in other part of uh, the area. I will not really <coughs> take your time. I think in these 35 years, we learned few lessons which are very, very important because we are today talking about poverty reduction. We have amazing scholars. The first and the most important lesson which we learned here, everywhere, you know, in 10 other countries, is if, you, if people organize themselves, institutionalize the organizations, they take maximum benefit of government's larger investment. For instance, Karakoram Highway was constructed, you know, the China-Pakistan Karakoram, you know, this, uh, this road. People took maximum benefit of Karakoram Highway because of they were very well organized. And I, I believe that when CPEC come, these people will take maximum benefit of this. The second 
And the most important lesson, which I think is very important for our nation, and we learned it hard way, primarily for several reasons. If you want to reduce poverty, for instance, when AKRSP started our program in Gilgit, Baltistan, World Bank used to evaluate us every four years. And in 10 years, they will wait at us that we have doubled the income of this area. The people's income doubled in this area in 10 years. But when this was implemented in India, and they give leadership to women, they achieved the same objective in just five years. So the lesson is that if we want to reduce poverty, elevate poverty, we have to give leadership to women for poverty reduction. Not give them a beneficiary. We have to close that chapter. I think this is our main lesson and which we think if we want to move forward for poverty reduction, we have to give leadership to, to women, no matter what their education is. The third most important lesson which we learned is, of course, if you get out of poverty, you have to create space for private sector. And in Pakistan, this is a major challenge now. We have a very limited space for private sector. If you create space for private sector, like we learned from China, then I think you can transform these people who are out of poverty into a growth model, so our country will uh, move forward. And the last and the most important thing, which I think they have all learned, which we learned recently, because of Pakistan's going through youth bulge, so we need to engage youth in development. That their potential should not be undermined. Thank you very much. Uh, now I'll open the house for questions. We already have two questions. Maybe perhaps the people who asked them would like to identify themselves. The first is, three more. we have three more. What is the future of the Benazir income support program? Doesn't it make people more poor? presented short-term solutions and long-term pain. Hi, can you run a subsidized program like the Benazir income in the long term? Question to Dr. Nuzer. Karachi is providing housing facility to 20 million. Lahore almost so the same. So why these domestic models can't be replicated? Dr. Zubair Sao, what's step one which institution to reform and how prioritize? Question to Rana Saab. How a merit-based selection of bureaucracy may sustain without providing equitable education access throughout the country? Why just have another question for you. Do we need a big civil service? Why can't we scrap some ministries? Now I'll open it to the floor. We'll take three questions from there, then each of the speakers will be able to answer them. Yes, sir, the first. The second has to be a lady. And uh, first, second, and then, of course, former Vice Chancellor, Nadeem ul Haq, Apeli. Yes, sir, Durani from Five School of Public Policy. Uh, first of all, let me allow to be a little blunt. Why is it not surprising that all the well-known economists sitting over here are so much supportive of the government intervention? Why they are not focusing on the private sector? The second, my question is related to what would be the policy alternatives based on the public-private partnerships that should provide solution to all the issues, the social issue confronting Pakistan today. Right. Thank I think you. you've raised two good questions. Why do we always talk about government? Why don't we talk about the role of the private sector and public-private partnership? And for gender equality, a lady in the front of somebody who would like to ask a question. Yes, we have somebody here. Please identify yourself. Uh, I'm Sadia Sherpas. I'm a PhD student at PIDE. 
Uh, sir, my question is actually from the whole panel, who can, whoever can answer this. Is there any possibility in future for land reforms in Pakistan? Because if my understanding is not wrong, a major reason for rural poverty happens to be landlessness. So is there any prospect or possibility for land reforms in Pakistan, at least in the foreseeable future? Well, we still have the people who raise very fundamental structuralist question. What about land reforms? Why, Shansu, sir? Gee, my question is to Bajad Rana. I think if I got his drift right, he's still thinking of maintaining the colonial civil service and tinkering at the margins in terms of merit and in terms of just getting the performance system right, rather like um, his task force chairman, Mr. Ishwat Sen. But I think, quite frankly, if you want to get into the 21st century, don't we want to deconstruct the civil service and have a civil service that is more in keeping with the modern times? Do we need to keep these silos of PS, etc.? Do we need still perks and plots, etc.? Do we need to maintain colonialism? So can you please tell us? Deconstruct the civil services. Asking it from a civil servant. I wonder what the reply would be. <laughs> well, we've had this and um, I'm not going to take too much time, so I'll ask, start in this same order, or should we start in the reverse order? Anyone? I, perhaps you would like to say something. Yes, I think uh, the question is very valid. Or um, I will start by saying that yes, it is very possible that they replicate it. But it happened that there are three or four things. One thing is that you political will for this. For this, there are many countries in which there is public-private partnership. They have been reconciled with these things that private is profit maximization and the public both social aspects and they have been able to reconcile and there are lots of models in the world of you need to uh, engage the stakeholder the communities as uh, you know when you say communities organize but the government has to be the facilitator the government has to provide the right incentives to the private sector for it to be replicated they, they this has been done all over the world there are lots of examples, certainly can be done. And that's the solution to the problem. Uh, well, I have uh, three questions. First, on uh, sustaining merit-based system when the education system is not equitable. Now, uh, recalling my experience interviewing the CSS candidates in the Federal Public Service Commission, I think it probably is, a, is based on misperception. Even in the CSS exam, 35 to 40 percent of the candidates passing that exam comes from the government schools. And majority of those who come from the private schooling system either don't appear in the CSS exam or those who come with a degree from abroad generally fails an essay and English composition. So uh, that much for equitable education system. But I think to, to, to answer this question, like you're right that we have to have equitable opportunities of gaining knowledge and to have a fair competition. The, 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 either the curriculum should be uh, uniform as the government has been claiming. But there is no harm in having uh, different categories of schooling, uh, depending upon the, upon the candidates. But in uh, all said and done, we are still maintaining that marriage-based recruitment, particularly through CSS exam, uh, uh, despite the fact that there is a huge difference between the different education system, especially the government institutions and the private institutions, yet the government uh, schools or institution graduates are uh, performing fairly well as compared to private school institutions or private university institutions. Second, uh, do we need that big civil service? Certainly not. 
And that's why I raised the fundamental issue that the government needs to decide about the size and structure of the government, especially after 18th Amendment, we need to cut down the size of the federal government as well as the provincial government as most functions are now devolved to the local or district level. This was done back in 2001, but after the election of uh, political, the democratic government in 2008, they reversed that model. In 2001, under Musharraf reforms, whether, although like, there were a lot of gaps in those reforms too, but all the provincial level departments were transferred, shifted to district level to perform the functions which once used to be performed at the provincial level. Once you do that, develop the local level bureaucracy, develop the local level civil service, probably you can easily cut down the provincial bureaucracy. But under the given circumstances, certainly the federal government size need to be cut down because many of the ministries are created to accommodate ministers. When we uh, eliminated or abolished 17 ministries at the federal level back in um, uh, 2010 after the 18th Amendment, we had to resurrect, although we don't have the power to resurrect, but recreate uh, uh, seven ministries overnight to accommodate ministers. So if the federal government decides to reduce the size of the cabinet, the ministries can also be merged and reduced. And this is also one of the uh, 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 subject that is being, sorry. I'm sorry, we were running out of oh, time. Sorry. We, said we got rid of the Ministry of Agriculture, <laughs> said it will be in the provinces, but we recreated a Ministry of Food Security. Yeah. So, you know, we, we are very good at finding things. I'll give you a few minutes yeah. and a few minutes before we finish. Thank you very much. Thank you. You know, what is the future of, uh, question is, what is the future of, I think, uh, Benazir Income Support Program is a political program, although it's a poverty elevation program, and PPP started and PMLN continued. I think PTI is also going to continue with Benazir. But, you know, program has weaknesses. Program should be redesigned, and the government is currently facing financial crisis, government do not have resources. At the moment, I think they are spending about more than 150 billion on Benazir Income Support Program. What I think can be done, I think they should eliminate the, uh, you know, cash transfer, eliminate the program of cash transfer under the Benazir Income Support Program, and they should continue the other component. And rather than providing cash support of 1,600, uh, rupees per month to a family, they should provide the microfinance uh, that I have proposed, you know, because microfinance has been very effective in reducing the poverty in various developing countries like Bangladesh, you know, India and other countries. So they should focus on the, you know, microfinance program. Uh, they should re-divert resource, divert resources from the BISP towards the microfinance program. I think diverting 50 billion rupees would be sufficient to provide I think financial loan of about uh, uh, to to about uh, two three million people. I think that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, which uh, which uh, reforms to prioritize? I mentioned in my presentation three areas: uh, government effectiveness, political stability, and uh, what was the third one? And uh, regulatory quality. Now you know. Because I was looking at uh, cross-country uh, comparisons, uh, I'm not necessarily commenting on how to sequence or what to prioritize in the case of Pakistan. That would need some kind of thought, a diagnostic study. But clearly, we need to work because Pakistan was in the, uh, among the countries in the negative territory for these three aspects of governance. We would need to work on all three areas, with, with, maybe with different speeds and depending on the resource constraints. So this is my response to the first uh, question. The second one was about the role of public policy and why not, uh, public, uh, why not allow the private sector to, to uh, evolve and flourish. I think you need to realize that the public sector is, the, is unique or government sector is unique in creating an incentive structure for the rest of the economy. 
through its taxation policies, through its regulatory uh, quality, and through its expenditure policies. All these three affect the incentives for the private sector. So you cannot ignore that and cannot leave it to the market. The development transformation, economic transformation that I talked about, actually the states that have evolved, like Malaysia, South Korea, the government played a fundamental role in the economic transformation. Countries where the, where the countries failed, there also the government uh, poorly performed, and that's why the whole society failed. Thank you. Thank you very much. In the end, I'll just say one or two points. You see, the pied, uh, inside the pied emblem, you'll see the word spirit of free inquiry, which also means speaking out your mind. I think one of the things we have to inculcate, whether it is in our students, whether in our analysts, whether in public servants, is to turn to people, whatever position they may be in, and say, with respect, sir, what you are saying is wrong. Whether it is a government minister, whether it's a private sector person. Keynes once said to the finance minister, he was traveling with the chancellor of the exchequer, he said, with due respect, sir, you're speaking absolute nonsense. Now, I know people may not want to go to this extreme, but speak out your mind. I think a lot of our problems in policy and implementation is that when the policy and implementation is being talked about, everybody keeps quiet because they don't want to get on the wrong side of anybody. Power. I have found that people who have stood their ground whether it was Justice Cornelius, whether there were other civil servants, including people like Javed Sadiq Malik, who stood their ground and said no. In the long term, they held the topmost positions and they did extremely well. The second point I want to emphasize is do not start following the paradigm of the day. Today it is A, today it is trickling down, tomorrow it is the Washington consensus, the third it is the neoliberals, the fourth is this. Country experiences are important, learn from them, but don't try to replicate them in your own country. Every country has to come up with its own policies depending on its own socio-economic conditions which the people and the academia and the researchers know better than any foreigner in the country. And last, I would say, is quality. That should be now the pursuit. Implementation, good quality implementation. We have increased the higher education output from 200,000 to one and a half million students coming out of the higher education commission stream. 40% of them are women, which is, I think, the really positive side of the country, which is, I am so happy when I see Pied students, Lahore School students, other students, and I see more and more women emerging. Pakistan's secret weapon is not its nuclear power. The secret women are our women who are going to come forward and allow this economy to grow and prosper, and they'll only be able to do so if we put in quality education. With these words, I think you'll all join me in thanking a very, very distinguished panel and very good lecture. Thank, thank now, you so much. Now I, I invite ask Dr. Dr. Rasha Damja to give souvenir to the panelists. Uh, first, I will uh, invite uh, Dr. Muhammad Ahmed Zubair. Dr. Talat Anwar. <coughs> Dr. Nozat Ayman. <laughs> Mr. Abdul Wajid Rana. <laughs> Mr. Muzaffaruddin. And I also request Mr. Muzaffaruddin to present a souvenir to Dr. Rashid Amjad. <coughs> Dr. Rashid Amjad.
So thank you so much for uh, giving us uh, uh, insights in this stuff. And now there is a break of 20 minutes. You are all requested to come back uh, for an, another session that will start sharply at 6 p.m. So that's very innovative session on regional connectivity. Thank you so much. Thank you.